a patient who's unresponsive for months and months and months. Usually, we associate that with the worst possible outcome. So how to explain this story from our Lee Cowan about a man who defied the odds and baffled the experts? When 28-year-old Jacob Handel was rushed to a Massachusetts emergency room four years ago, doctors thought the one-time chef, as young as he was, was having a stroke. But he wasn't. His scan showed something very different and very strange. Jake's brain seemed to be unplugging itself from the rest of his body. The wires weren't sending the signals from place to place. Dr. Brian Edlow examined Jake in the ICU. and He wasn't sure at first what was causing it until Jake made a confession. He told him he partied pretty hard, and that included doing drugs, opioids mostly, until he turned to street heroin. Jake's medical team surmised he probably ingested a toxin somewhere along the way. That's what was causing the damage, leading to a very rare condition with a very long name. Toxic Acute Progressive Leukoencephalopathy. There are only a few dozen people since the first report in 1982 of the type of brain injury that Jacob experienced. Within six months, Jake was little more than a stare. He had ceased any conscious movement. We believed that he was in a vegetative state, completely unaware of himself or the environment. He was placed in an extended care facility where he lay, breathing by machine, fed through a tube, day after day. Eventually, he was put in hospice. You know, by Christmas that year, uh, they actually called us and said, it's, it's over. You know, he's got a couple of days. His stepfather, Eli Wyland, not even sure if Jake could hear him, went to say goodbye nonetheless. I just was whispering to him, it's like, it's okay, you know, we love you. You know, you don't, you don't need this pain anymore. Um, You know, and just, you know, it's okay to go. And I'm like, I appreciate that, but no. Looking good. Jake didn't die that night, or the next, or the one after that. Oh, my God. (laughs) Good move. Thank you. Instead, Jake's brain somehow sputtered back to life. His doctors still aren't sure how. There are very few people like Jacob who have ever been described in the medical literature. It's a crazy story. It's a crazy story. It's hard for me to believe this story sometimes. If I was or you're sitting, I'd be like, no. Yep. Like, no, that didn't happen. His remarkable recovery started really almost by accident, or fate, maybe, when a doctor happened to notice a tiny movement in Jake's wrist. It was like a twitch. Just like that, huh? Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah. Some thought it meant nothing, that it was involuntary, but his family thought otherwise. Were you optimistic? Did you think he was going to get out of this? Or Optimistic might be, might be too strong a word, hopeful. Maybe. You know? But it's what happened a few weeks later that really stunned everyone. A E I O U. Jake started moving his tongue and his eyes almost imperceptibly at first, but enough to use a letter board to spell out a message that he'd been desperately trying to send for almost a year. First thing I said was, I can hear you. That was the first thing. Yeah, I can hear you. As the word slowly appeared, doctors realized that Jake hadn't been unconscious for the past year. He wasn't blissfully unaware of his descent into nothingness. Instead, Jake had actually been awake the whole time, locked inside a coffin that was his own body. I couldn't express anything to anyone. No one knew what was going on in my head. I just wanted someone to know like that I was in there. To go through all of that, being fully aware and having others not realize it, I can't even imagine the, the feeling of isolation or the sensation of fear that one might experience. It's truly humbling to think about how little we understood his brain function at that time. For months, he was silently trapped somewhere between living and not living. As time wore on, he noticed that the visits began to slow. 
He heard nurses call him brain dead. He even remembers being given last rites. Did you feel alone? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I felt, I felt very alone. I talked to myself a lot, a lot. And there were times where I was like, I've had enough, I can't do it. But it would always make it to the next day and be like, all right, carry on. On top of hearing everything, Jake could feel everything too. I was like, ah, oh, this is the worst because I had so many needs and I was in so much pain and I couldn't even tell anyone I need help or like my mouth is dry or like or I'm hungry or I love you or don't worry. These were the hardest things. To pass the time, Jake would do math problems in his head just to help keep himself from the guilt that his drug use had caused all of this. And the doctors kept saying, like, this is so rare, it's not your fault. And I'm like, like, that's a nice thing to say, but I caused this. Like, damn. I definitely had a big feeling of how disappointed my mother would be in me. My mom would find this awfully funny. Jake's mom died of breast cancer when he was just 19. She had a long, miserable fight. Jake started using drugs to escape and to cope. I was so unhappy that I was not thinking about the future. Everything was like falling apart. I weaned myself off. I got myself off. You tried to quit. Oh, hundreds of times, but always kind of like slipped up again. Jake was still lost in that fog as he began to recover. Green. Blue, space. Michelle Braley, Jake's Red. speech language pathologist, was helping him learn to speak Blue. again. But early on, the words that came Blue. out just screamed of a mental Blue. anguish that made her just as much a counselor as a Blue. pathologist. He would say, you know, do I deserve this? Am I going to have to live like this the rest of my life because of the stakes that I made? Those were the types of conversations. And, and how did you answer? Them? It's really hard. Well, the answer is no, you don't deserve this. I mean, that's the answer. Nobody deserves this. Hey, just keep it going. Keep it going. Yeah. It wasn't just speech Jake had to relearn. It was everything. His muscles had been frozen for so long, even the slightest movement was excruciating. But... Bit by bit, through months of work at the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston, nice job. Jake's body Good started work. to function again, putting on shoes, buttoning buttons, all things he never thought twice about before. For someone that has no coordination in their brain, apparently, not bad. His cousin Kim even helped him get back to cooking again, cracking eggs and cracking himself up go. at the same time. <laughs> It's very possible an egg might end up over there. <laughs> oh my God. He's gotten his own apartment where, with help, he's returning to a life without drugs and without the self-doubt and the grief that put him in that spiral in the first place. Bueno. Bueno. I don't particularly think there's anything super special about me, per se, I think... You really don't? Anybody has the capacity to do this if they have the willpower. But that's the thing. Not everybody has Jake's willpower. And very few have survived literally being scared to death and come back with such a profound understanding of what a second chance really means. I am an improved Jake. And I'm a happier Jake. I don't want to give up. 